Uh, this Veterans History Project interview was being conducted on Wednesday, March the 30th in the year 2016 here at the Niles Public Library. Uh, my name is uh, Neil O'Shea. I'm a member of the reference staff and I'm privileged to serve as the Veterans History Project coordinator at the library. And I'm uh, fortunate today to be speaking with Mr. Fred Ziegler. Uh, Mr. Ziegler was born on November the 10th in the year 1928 and now lives in Niles. Uh, no, Chicago. You live in Chicago, thank you. I did live in Chicago. But you were Correct. born in, you live in Niles now though? Correct. Yeah, thank you. So you were born uh, in 1928 in Chicago and you now live in Niles. Correct. Uh, and Mr. Ziegler learned of the Veterans History Project through the breakfast I'm wondering through the annual breakfast. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, and he has kindly consented to be interviewed for the Veterans History Project. Uh, and here is his story. Uh, Mr. Ziegler, how would you prefer to be addressed during this interview? Fred, Fred is fine. Fred is okay. fine. Yeah. 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 And we're very, we're especially uh, favorably disposed toward uh, toward Fred because he has uh, made a gift to the libraries of the Chicago area. Uh, a history, pictorial history of the Victory Division, the 24th, and its service in Korea. And after we display this at the library, we hope to be able to convey it to the uh, Pritzker Military Library in downtown Chicago. So thank you for sharing that also. Sure. Okay. Uh, Fred, uh, when did you enter the service? Uh, September 28th, 1950. 1950. Yeah. And at that time, you were living in Chicago. Chicago. Do you recall what you were doing at the time? I was working as an auto mechanic. Yeah. Um, so at that time, um, you would have been about 22, almost 22 years of age. Correct. Year, yeah. Late 21. Right. Um, I had just gotten uh, engaged two months earlier. Oh my goodness. So it was a surprise when I got the, the draft notice. And I certainly didn't want it, you know, at yeah, the time. Yeah, the fact that you're engaged, that doesn't cut any ice. Not right? a thing. Not a thing. No. And then, uh, if I may ask, where had you gone to uh, to high school in Chicago? Lane Tech. You were a Lane Tech Indian. Yeah. Yeah, yeah terrific school. Yeah. Um, so you were drafted, so you, you didn't have a choice of, of service. You were right. drafted into the U.S. Army. Yeah. Yeah. And do you recall where you were inducted? Or Oh, somewhere along Clark Street is where the place was. Clark, and I'm going to say Barry Avenue. There was a second story office up there where they wanted us to come into. So that know. was kind of like North Clark then, right? Yeah, correct. Barry's about black south of Belmont or something, I think. Mm, just about. Yeah, You're right. 3100, yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Do you recall what your first days were like in the Army? Was it a big change? Not much of anything. Uh, we went down there. And uh, we had not gotten to a point where they had an outfit aligned yet for us, you know. So we waited a week, we waited the second week and third week. And finally they got a group together and those guys were sent to Colorado. Uh, my name being Ziegler, I was at the end of the line. So I just waited until so so they got it and they, they got their quota of men and they went. And I stayed behind, or two of us stayed behind. So when you say you stayed behind, you were staying behind at... At Fort Knox. At Fort Knox in Kentucky. Correct, right. So you went down there by train or bus? Correct. Right. But train. By train. Yeah. yeah. And then did you complete your, uh, your basic training down there? Correct. Well, they had another, another outfit was Camp McCoy, Wisconsin. I missed that one too. So apparently they had enough men enough there to start another company of, uh, of uh, basic training, you know, for us. And then we stayed at Fort Knox for the basic training. And then later we stayed there for the secondary training of Specialized, which was tank training. And I became a tanker. So um, when you say tank, you mean a motorized vehicle. You Correct. don't mean a an oiler or anything like no, that. No, no, no. Yeah. So you did the, so the basic training is like six, eight weeks? Eight weeks. Eight weeks. Yeah. And then you were, the specialized training in the, in the tank. Right. 
Did that also take place at, at uh, Fort Knox? At Fort Knox. Right. Must that also was about eight weeks. Also, it must be a big base. It had, to, it had been closed for after World War II, and they were reopening places because of the war in Korea. They needed uh, soldiers, you know, training and everything. So we bumped into when we were really everything was uh, old from the World War II, you know, and we had to be re uh, oh we had to be uh, outfitted, you know, with whatever we could get there at the time. And then the equipment, I suppose, was right. gradually upgraded. Right, and we went into the winter of 50, which was pretty cold, and we didn't have any field jackets yet, you know. They had to get some from somewhere and ship them to Fort Knox so we could have something that was warm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, was that your first time away from home, or were you called? No, no, I'd been up to Wisconsin several times. I liked fishing. Oh. <laughs> so there were any uh, memorable drill instructors, or...? Uh... Yes. We, uh, the, the platoon leader we had was actually 17 years old. He, he joined the Army underage, and he was a very brusque young man, you know, and none of the guys wanted to take it from him because all of us were in our 20s already, you know. But he was good, and he knew what he was doing. You know. yeah. yeah. And then, um, so you didn't mind the food or the no. regimen or no. you, you're realistic about it? Yeah. So then, after, um, so then after boot camp, you went to another... Uh, after board. boot camp, no. I stayed there again. Uh, they never had another assignment again. Uh, so what we did, they signed us to uh, the motor pool to drive buses. And what we were doing is driving uh, officers to the tank range, you know, to, for their training. And then we would pick them up and bring them back. And then another period of time, I was a, uh, I volunteered to be a KP. Primarily because there was nothing to do and you get bored. That lasted about a week or so. And then after that I volunteered for the post office. And I, we had to forward mail. Everybody was being forwarded all the time. So you had a lot of mail that had to be sent to the guys that were that had left the camp. So yeah. So um when did when did you depart for Korea then? Uh, that was somewhere in May of 51. We, uh, after we got through with this training, we got a, finally got our assignment, which was the Far East Command. And we got a 30-day leave at that point, and we were to go home and uh, leave from Chicago aboard the El, El Capitan to California. You know. And that was about in the middle of May. Yeah. yeah. So there were, were there um, some guys from the unit then? You, were, you went through basic one, training together and then you right, also... Just one. He oh, came to my one. house oh. in Chicago because we had to leave from Chicago. Oh, so we, we went out there together, the two of us. Yeah. yeah. So um, in civilian life, you you had been an automotive mechanic. Right. And so that the Army made a good, a good choice of... Well, we didn't know that yet. You didn't know that. No. You, when you go overseas, you're... You're blank. And once you get to, we got to Yokohama, at that time they started processing papers, you know, to put everything in order. I don't know what they do, but I mean, from there, from Yokohama, then we went to the, the Yellow Sea, which is on the west side of Korea. So. Yeah. Did you make that journey by ship? Yes. Did you get sick? In the North Pacific we did, yes. That was very rough weather, yeah. The one thing that's difficult is going to the bathroom when the ship is going up and down. Yeah. Did you, um, did, was there like anybody going stir crazy on the ship for lack no, of, not no? particularly, no. It's just boring. 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 They have cards or something or, yeah, yeah. 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 <clears throat> so then you, um, you land in Korea, is it? Yeah. Yeah. June 10th, in China. 
that was a beachhead several months before. You know, they, after the, uh, the uh, Chinese came down and pushed us all the way back down to Pusan, then they had to come back up again. And that's when they, uh, I don't know which outfit went in, but they went in on Incheon and they cut across to cut them off, more or less. And then we started to go back north again. Yeah. You know. I think that was reckoned to be a kind of a brilliant uh, strategic. military strategic move. Yes, like very much so. Yeah. 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 So, then, uh, so then you came in on in Incheon then after it had been, after this... After the, uh, the invasion of it, yeah. Yeah, the invasion. And so at this time, do you know that you're, you know that you're going to be in a... No. Still don't know. Still don't know. Yet. Okay. But uh, we went on a train, and from train we started to go north. Uh, we don't know where we're at. You, you just, you're there and you're going, you know. And at the terminal where we ended up, that we got on a truck. And at the truck, we took another trip for wherever we were going to, you know, to, to engage with our outfit. And then once I got there, they apparently knew that I had been a mechanic, and they signed me to the tank, the tank company, you know, the 6th tank, tank battalion is what it was. And at that point, they dropped me off there, and the rest of the fellas that had gone up to probably infantry. So I stayed with the outfit there, and uh, that was it. And I was there. And I stayed there for another seven months. Yeah. And then your, your, your one buddy who came up to you with Chicago and went out, was he with you at this time? No. Too? Oh. No. He split off somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, never saw him anymore. So was it... Um, when did you get, you were promoted to corporal at one point, right? Yeah. Right. Well, I got a private right there, private first class, and then we got corporal within about a month or so, you know. Uh, the, the thing was happening, actually, is we were replacing the original soldiers that were there, you know. And as we came in, the newcomers came in, we would replace one, two, one, two. And these were the guys that had... Uh, rank. And as we came in, we got rank as far as that goes, too. Uh, and I'd say within a period of a month or so, we replaced all the soldiers that were there to begin with that started the war in uh, Korea. The, they came from uh, Texas, is where the 6th tank was uh, originated at. And the division was actually out of, uh, of uh, Hawaii. And just recently, there was an article that the 24th was abolished. It was uh, uh, broke up. It was, there's no more. There's no more 24th division. See? So whoever took over that. So, but uh, we did what we were supposed to do, and we got quite a few commendations from headquarters because most of the tanks we got. We got them in and we got them out, you know. And we did a lot of work that uh, uh, was usually sent down to uh, uh, I can't think of it now. It's a it's an area where usually they send the material up from uh, the base, you know. I mean, in South Korea, when we were still there, uh, if the tank went bad, they would put it on the low boy and they would drive it down to Ordnance. And once we got up to North Korea, it was all mountains. You couldn't do anything with the tank. It was just too dangerous to go through the uh, mountain passes to get out of there, you know. So we left the tanks there, and when we needed parts, we would strip the tank and use those parts to repair the tank. Yeah. So at this time you're actually in North Korea, which yes. is now North Korea. Right, right. But the terrain is not as conducive to using right. tanks. Right, right. We, we, we went through Weijangbu to begin with. And then from there we went through Huachan Reservoir where the second battle was taking place. And the third one was Kumwa Valley. That's where we ended up. And that was in uh, December of 50, uh, 51. And that was a real cold winter. It was 25 below zero, 
and we were just, we were frozen, period, you know. But uh, in that process, we stayed there until uh, they had started the process of uh, uh, the trying to make the 38th parallel, the separation. Mm -hmm. What was going on at that time, they were in negotiating between us and the North Koreans and China to try and make that uh, uh, decision, yeah. you yeah. know. Um, were those, those tanks, were they Sherman T somethings or? Well, when this, they had Sherman tanks, there were two of them. But they were used as tank retrievers. Mm. We had gotten the new ones, the M46s. They're wonderful, really wonderful machine, you know. Uh, the thing that was I always enjoyed, well, I didn't do any, uh, any fighting or anything like that, but what they used to do is they used to have a gyroscope on the gun. In other words, as you went up and down on the thing, the gyroscope would keep the gun level to where you were going to uh, fire it at, you know. And it couldn't really move out. I mean, of course, there were not very many places that they could do that. But there was one thing that had happened, this was told from the guy before, when the outfit was down in Pusan perimeter, that was earlier in 1950, they kept the, tr the tanks on train, tr train cars because they had to be moved back and forth, you know, and they were firing off the tank cars at the enemy. Wow. And then as they finally got through with the Incheon invasion, they could move off and they moved them north, you know, yeah. the North Koreans and the Chinese. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if you're if you're working on cars, automobiles, mm -hmm. it's not that difficult then to transfer to working to on on tanks. Or? It's a little different. It is a little different. I bet. It's called bulwark. Everything was heavy. Everything was heavy. You know. To pull a tank engine out of that, which is what we had to do. Uh, we had to separate it if a transmission was bad, put a new transmission in. See, we couldn't send the truck down to, the tank down to ordnance. They sent the transmission up there and we used to separate them from the back. That was way beyond what our nomenclature was supposed to be, you know. What ours was supposed to be is start them, clean the battery terminals, you know, things like that. My particular job was uh, uh, adjusting the the junction boxes inside the tank floor. Uh, what it was was a uh, a little Joe. It was a small 10 horsepower engine plus the other one, which is about I don't recall, but I think it was a 1300 horsepower. It was a 12 cylinder engine, you know. Uh, but they had to have. Uh, a generating system that was strong enough to start these big engines. And I had to adjust those uh, uh, relays so they would always produce at least 16 uh, volts of, uh, of power for the batteries to receive them, you know, so. The, um, does the cold weather affect the ability, the functioning of the mach machinery? Oh yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. One of the pictures there is, is in a tent. That one, yeah. See, there's snow on the ground here, but they put that tent up so we could work inside rather than being outside. Yeah. Yeah. The maintenance tent. Yeah. Wow. During the summer, there was nothing. You did everything outside. When I got there in June, in July and August, I mean, when you worked on the tanks outside in the sun, they were just like hot hot metal, you know, they just seem to absorb the sunlight. Difficult. Yeah. Did you get any um, um, R&R or, or oh, yeah. rest period mm -hmm. in Japan or something? Yeah, or? in October, uh, we were ready, we were rotating one or two guys at the time, and we got four days R&R, they flew us into to Tokyo, and I stayed at the Demiji Hotel, Really classy, but it means it had been just redone for all the soldiers to be there, you know. And it's right next to the Imperial Palace, so 
when I, we had the time, I walked out and I walked around a little bit. I stood outside the Imperial Palace just to look inside because yeah. you're not allowed to go inside. Yeah. You know, so. So you, yeah. liked, you liked Tokyo or the. Well, I didn't enough. do much, you yeah. know. Yeah. What you did, you did a little drinking, you know, and you talked to the guys. There was a stadium right next to it, you know, and they were playing football. The Japanese were playing football. So this other friend of mine from our outfit, Willoughby, he went, him and I were the ones that went this time, so we sat in the stands. The problem was we were drinking a little bit, you know. So Beer? Yeah, 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 yeah. And, of course, we had a little bit too much, so we left, you know. Yeah. So how were the, um, the rations or the food in Korea? Was it good? Good food, yeah. Was that Korean food or was it no, no. Was American? American food, food. Yeah. all the way. Yeah. 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 Did they... Um, so three they meals, did. always three meals yeah. a day. But once in a while, if you were away uh, and they didn't have anything, every vehicle had a uh, ration pack in it. So you could pick up in a couple cans. You could always have something to eat. Yeah. No. The, um, were there any USO shows or visiting entertainment? There was one close by at one point. And you, you, not everybody could leave, so we had to kind of find out who's the one that's going to leave. I don't know if we had raffles or what it was, but I'm sure it was Bob, uh, Bob Hope was the one of them. Yeah. So um, you mentioned uh, the football game in Japan, and then do you recall any other particularly humorous or unusual events? No. That was probably just a little highlight of being in the service, you know. Yeah. Being somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you're, 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 you left Korea before the armistice was, was signed then? Or? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I left, uh, uh, we left Korea in January. I'm going to say about the 10th of January. 1953. Then, no, no. 52. 52. Yeah, and then we went to Japan. And we stayed in Japan. Well, I stayed in Japan until about, about May or June. Yeah. And then I was sent home because my time was running out. Yeah. We only had to stay in 21 months. And my wife or my girlfriend was getting our particulars to get her to get married at the church and yeah. all the stuff. Yeah, the, uh, so those four, those four months or so that you were in Japan, was that near Tokyo also uh, or no? No, no. That was about 10 miles from the Camp Fujiyama. It, it, was, uh, oh, it was North Camp Fujiyama, which was 10 miles from the mountain. We could see that every day. But they had a North Camp Central and a South Camp, so we stayed there. There was nothing expected of us to do anything except go on guard duty, you know. We rotate uh, probably every week or so, and nothing, nothing was expected of us. We did go out to the, uh, the barn where they had our tanks because it was a training, training field as well. And I found a small, uh, small oh, a light tank, and I was working on that just to work on it. It had two Cadillac engines in it. I could drive it around and then come back again. But at some point, they were all taken down to the shoreline. I wasn't there then, but they took all the tanks, took them down to the shoreline, and they were being shipped somewhere. We didn't know where they went. Yeah. The, um, so was it hard to stay in touch with people at home or your no, fiancé no. no. during that time? Letters came? Yeah. Nothing. My wife, she sent... Letters practically every day. Nothing censored going back and no, forth. No, 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 no. Yeah. And then, um, so you come back to the United States from Japan by ship into... You know, I don't even remember that. I yeah. think I flew all the way home. Oh, wow. Yeah. Because all I remember was landing at O'Hare. You know, and then we went from there to Fort Sheridan. And Fort Sheridan has got the... Uh, the, uh, the elevator all the way out there, you know. So we just got on the elevator, came all the way down to Belmont Avenue, and just took the bus, and I was home. So you were discharged at, uh, 
at Fort Sheridan yes. probably. Yeah. Well, I did have to go back. I got a day, another delay in route. I mean, I could go home and we had another probably 10, 15 days that they had to eat up, you know. And then I went back for about four or five more days till the end. And then they would just say, uh, your discharge papers. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, yeah, you were already working and then you were going to be married. I mean, you, there was no thought of making a career of the Army. No. No. Yeah. Although a friend of mine who had been over there too, because uh, we came from a group of boys around the corner, he had been just south of me. He, was, he worked out of the railroad because he was on the railroad all the time. But we had talked, once we got home, we talked about it and said, you know, maybe we should have stayed in the Army. We would have had so many years in by now. We would have definitely been sergeant or something, you know. Once you get up in the rank, you don't have to do a heck of a lot. You get everybody else to do the work, you know. Of course, that was only come see, you know, we never did anything about it. We, we let it go. Yeah. So, uh, so the lady that be, your, your, your fiancé, she saw you in uniform then. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. 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 And then um, when you mentioned the boys in the corner, was there a neighborhood that you used to? Yes. What, what was it? School in Southport. School in Southport. Yeah. yeah. You know, the Lincoln Belmont... Lincoln, Belmont, and... That intersect, that... Yes. Damon or... Ashland. Ashland, Ashland Lincoln, and Belmont. Yeah, yeah, that's busy. It was a very busy site at one time, you know, yeah. when we were kids, yeah. Was there a Weebolt store there? There was a Weebolt there. There was a Gold Blast there. The Belmont Theater. The Lincoln Theater. City Theater. Oh, gosh, it was very, very busy, yeah, as kids. I think I read once that that was the next to State in Madison. That You're right. It was. It was that that busy. Yeah. There was a bank there, Lakeview Trust and Savings Bank. It was the only one that survived outside of downtown through the depression, through the when the the it, the economy caved in on the on the 29th of uh, October. Yeah. It's the only one that stayed open. Yeah. Had. Um, was there a tradition of military service in your family? Or? No. Well, my father was in the war in Germany. Yeah. He, he, and my, he and his brother were machine gunners. They got in the Army when they were 16 years old. And where they were situated, nothing ever happened. See? So he was okay with that. Yeah. So. He had a horse step on his foot, so he did have a, a slight limit. Yeah. yeah. But, sure. And then Ziegler is a German name, probably. Yes. Yeah. 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 Southern Germany. Southern Germany. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then you didn't uh, you didn't have any trouble transitioning back into regular life because no, it was all I went back to where I had a job before, and he took me back, and uh, it was a small auto repair shop. We did trucks as well as the thing. There used to be a, an area called George Street. And it was a lot of uh, meat packing, provisions, uh, all kind of stuff like that that was going on, you know. Uh, so there was always work to be done. Yeah. When you were at, um, at Lane Tech High School, did you take any shop or tech courses that kind of prepared you for it? Yeah. They had a Smith Hughes course. In the last year of high school, you got four periods a day of auto shop for the whole year. You know, which was really focused on something. I got very good marks. So yeah, I think they're. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, so then after the war, did you uh, stay in contact with any of your buddies or? I wrote to one of them, and I think I got an answer back, but that kind of just died. Yeah. You know. So did you did you did you join a veterans organization or anything like Not that? Not right away. Yeah. No. Uh, this other fellow that was there in, in Korea at that time, he joined an outfit that was the guy that had to own the tavern. Uh, he belonged to one, so he wanted him to sign up, and then he got me to sign up. Well, I, I never went to a meeting or anything like that. Now, another one of my friends, he stayed in Japan. He never got to Korea. He was a machinist. And he joined an outfit because of his brother-in-law, and then he asked me to join, and I belonged to uh, Highland Park, 4737. You know, uh, Senator uh, 
Uh, Kirk or Kirk. Yeah. That's his outfit. He's a Navy I, guy, I think. Yeah. 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 But I'd never been up there to a meeting, but I went there for a lunch or a dinner once we had there, you know. Yeah. But I... That's a VFW post, right? Correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so there weren't any, yeah, and of course, because the 24th Division, they can't have reunions now because you were saying that they're... Just broke up. Just broke yeah. up, yeah. Yeah. So, Fred, I, I sense that we're nearing the, the end of the interview, um, uh, and the Library of Congress recommends that we pose these questions to mm -hmm. all of the vets, the veterans. Um, Fred, how do you think your military service and military experiences affected your life? Hmm. It promotes a lot of thought as far as having been there and happenings over there. Uh, you can't help it, you know, it's such an impact on your life that you don't know. One thing was there's a lot of fear and you don't know what the fear is, but you know there's fear, you know, uh, no matter what you're doing, where you're at. Uh, one of the fellows had picked up a thought, what was actually they thought was a mine, but it was actually was as a canister for a Thompson machine gun. And everybody told him to leave it alone, and he wanted to touch it. Well, nothing happened, you know. But those are the kind of things you're always worried about. When the, uh, the engineers used to come in and get us a new area, they had to clean all the mines out. In other words, don't go past that area. That's your place, stay there, you know. You can go along the road or so, but uh, you were consciously aware, you know. Yeah. Um, do you think your, uh, your military experience uh, has influenced your thinking about war or about the military in general? I don't think so. Of course, you always come up with ideas you think you might have an idea that would be helpful, you know, yeah. in, 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 in the event of the war and controlling it or doing the best thing for it. And yet, I'm not in the position to make that kind of a judgment. It's only that I think that I know, you yeah. know, but I don't. Some of the, um, the veterans um, feel that reintroducing the draft would not be a bad idea. I thought of that a long time ago, and it would only be a draft for a year. For a year. Yeah. You get through your basic training, you do it, and then you go back. I think they do that in Israel, you know. Yeah. Everybody gets into the draft. Even if you're not physically able, you can do something. For your country. Yeah. Right, you know. I think it would settle people down, you know. I think what we're trying to do is we're trying to live precariously in our lives, you know. The old day of, you know, when there used to be, you got through at school, if you advanced to things, nobody of our group ever went to college. Nobody had the money to do that, you know. But if you do that, you go to college, go into the army, you serve, which is really a good thing for a person to do. You know, there's the old saying, in giving, uh, of yourself, you know, you're helping somebody. And I think you could help yourself. You understand more, you know. Yeah. Um, Fred, is there anything you would like to add to the interview that we may not have covered? Oh. <laughs> well, there was a period we had to go down to the D company. We had to replace the transmission in it. And I got dysentery. And I got dysentery bad. And there was a mass unit there, right there with the group. And uh, they gave me some uh, penicillin, got me on a plane and shipped me down to Pusan. And I was down there for, for two weeks. But I was... Uh, I improved, got better, and went back to my outfit, you know, so I stayed. That was terrible. Oh, my goodness. I'll tell you. I bet you lost weight. I did lose weight, yeah. Yeah. Not much, though, but, yeah. And the medical care was, was good? Yes. Yeah. 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 
The dysentery, that was brought on by a bug or a germ or something? Uh, Probably something I had eaten. Yeah. You know? The, the only other thing I think that you can remember that I've always shared, when we're sitting on that, that ship out in the Yellow Sea, you know, all you have to do is inhale. And it smells like the outhouse in the forest preserve. Why is that? Because they use all the waste for fertilizer. They call them honey buckets. They get their buckets, you know, they put this board right, there. Right, yeah. And they carry it, they carry it right out to the rice field. They don't have any that they can buy or anything like that. They use that. So the whole country smelled like shit. That would be a memory. Oh, goodness, yeah. You got used to it. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, yeah the South Korea is an impressive nation today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they had the, uh, they had the uh, Olympics. I don't recall, it was probably 10 years ago or so, mm -hmm. to see what they had built up. It's, it's amazing. Yeah. It's really amazing. And they're really, there. um, we had a uh, Remembering the Korean War uh, exhibition here put together by Mr. Chin Lee. Mm -hmm. And uh, he and his associates are so thankful to the, to the American veterans for what they, uh, yeah. Yeah, for saving their country. You know, I don't doubt he came over to our house once. I, that's why I would have, I, I never got older, I wasn't feeling good at the time. But uh, there was a, a Korean, uh, Oriental people, husband and wife, that came in. We were selling whatever we had. We had just moved and we had stuff to get rid of and everything. And my sister was there and she mentioned, she said, uh, uh, Hi, where are you from? And they said, from Korea. And then she said, oh, my, my brother was in Korea during the war. And he said, oh, yeah? And then he came over, gave me a gigantic hug. I mean, it really, yeah. right here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, most of the time that people think about the forgotten war, it's a forgotten war. You know, they always talk about World War I, World War II, Vietnam War, Iraq, and everything. They forget about Korea. There were some 34,000 guys that died there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Fred, have you, have you made that honor flight, or was that a consideration for you to go on the honor flight to, to Washington, D.C.? No. 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 no, my wife passed away about three years ago. My son did six months later, or he died first, and then my wife died later. I have COPD, and I can't walk a lot, you know, and if they wanted you to go to different places, that would be, no, I just... Wouldn't be interested. Yeah, yeah. play it safe. Yeah. 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 Well, Fred, thank you for a very interesting uh, sure. interview. And, uh, you know, your contributions today uh, uh, help us to uh, keep the Korean War yes. uh, yeah. alive or people aware of the sacrifices that were made. Yeah. So, thanks very much. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, thank you. Real good. Yeah. Okay. okay, so now we got to. For the, for the oil that's inside the tank. Uh, compartment, you know, and they showed the one fellow said, you, you're not going to get any if you try to order them. You'll have to repair them, you know, and that's what we did. Yeah. We took, uh, I wasn't there at this time, but some of the other guys, they took a turret off. This is definitely ordnance, and even some of that work would go back to Japan. Let's take the turret off, took another one and put it on to fit and put it back online. Yeah. The idea is to get it back online. When you were um, sailing into Incheon, right? And what, say what? When you were sailing into Incheon, yeah. yeah. did you know what you would wind up doing? No. 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 Everybody's fear fearful of being infantry, 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 you know. You're right up there online. But I remember they said something in basic training. What they said was only one man in ten actually gets up to infantry. Everything is a support unit, you know, for that. You know. So, not that that made any difference, because you'd be the young lucky guy. But I was fortunate, you know. Yeah. We were in a combat zone. We were within three miles of the 
the front all the time. We could see the stuff going out. At the end of Kumwa Valley, you could see them trying to go up the hill with tracers, you know, and you'd watch them. And at nighttime, you'd see the planes overhead. I'm not see them, but hear them overhead. And then one of the guys says, well, those are the Eggman. And boom, 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 boom. They'd be going at the Poignan, bombing it, you know. Every once in a while, you heard a light, a light plane go over, and that was Bed Check Charlie. What he used to do, he's a Korean. We had to drive a, a Piper Cub. He'd turn off the motor, you know, and glide, take out a hand grenade and throw it down at you, you know. It wasn't any by us, but that was the storyline. Yeah. Very, very uh, interesting. Yeah, as you say, interesting, and then also that, that factor of the fear. Yeah. You're in a war zone. Yeah. You just quite can't be you sure. You never know. Fred, thank you for a very interesting postscript. Sure. Thank okay. you, sir. Yeah. <laughs>